Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we've got David Tran. He is the founder of Dope Magazine. He's also, after getting, you know, selling that to High Times, he's a founder and CEO or co-founder of uh, Goldfinger Consulting Firm as well as, as, well as Fairchild, uh, an events a company. Um, but Dave, thanks for being on The Talking Hedge. How you doing, Josh? I'm good, good man. Good, good, good to see you, brother. Absolutely. Yeah, good to see you in person. It's been a minute. Uh, for those who haven't heard of your existence, the Tranimal, uh, can you kind of tell us about how you got into the industry, what you've been up to for the last, I don't know, almost decade, and, uh, and what you're doing? No, very fortunate to be a part of the cannabis industry. And, you know, I, I got here via the bar industry. Uh, that's what I actually am celebrating my 17 year anniversary for one of my first uh, bars that we have here in Seattle called Cowgirls Inc. So to me, it's always been about hospitality and marketing and branding. Uh, just always love building things from the ground up. And, you know, uh, you know, I've been very fortunate to be able to, you know, do that in the bar industry and then transition it into the uh, cannabis industry. So tell me a little bit about that transition with Dope Magazine. You got in there and how, how exactly did that formulate? How did you jump into a magazine company? Uh, it doesn't seem like something that's that easy to do, but you made it happen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, in 2011, we, uh, I got the opportunity to start a medical uh, retail store in Ballard. And, uh, you know, I was approached by uh, a couple of gentlemen who later became my partners, and they started uh, one of the first uh, medical stores called Conscious Care. And so when I had the opportunity to jump in there, it was really eye opening. Uh, we opened that in 2011. And immediately I knew that there wasn't enough education. And, you know, as a marketer, I didn't have a lot of opportunities to market my business and you know that was really to me my core competencies at the time building four bars uh you know where do I advertise you know how do I get this out to the masses and uh again looking at my coffee table at my store uh, there was only like two options and one was a small one about this big that you couldn't read and you know you could tell right away that you know uh they were selling those ads for like three thousand dollars. So, uh, and people were utilizing because again, there was no uh, resources. So uh, immediately, uh, you know, I picked the phone. I called my partner, who actually was doing a magazine in the bar world, and we've been working together. And that was James Zahogny and Evan Carter. So, us five very quickly had that aha moment. Gave them a call. They understood what the vision was, and in very quickly, we put it together. We saw that Hemp Fest was coming in 30 days. And we said, you know what? We need to get this up and going. So immediately called up someone, got the first funding. And, you know, again, blind faith, you know, that, I mean, how can I explain it to them? It's just like, we're going to do a cannabis magazine. Has it been done before? Never. But we are excited about it. And I think that's the awesome part about uh, building trust within, you know, your network so that when that does happen, you're easily able to pull that off. And in 30 days, we pulled together some resources and ended up getting the mayor at the time who was going to speak at uh, Hempfest. And that was, he was one of the first mayors in the whole country to be able to step out in public and be able to do that. And so uh, we got the magazine out and the rest was history, you know, and I think we got a little bit of publicity because, you know, there was a mayor uh, in front of a magazine called Dope. And I think a lot of people utilize that in a negative way. But as they say, sometimes a little bit of that negative publicity gave us a nice little head start. Absolutely. So you got into it very early on. There was a lot of interesting things. You know, even though High Times has been around for a while, it's kind of, they, they were really writing about how to grow. You guys were one of the first to really touch on the culture of it. And you you brought in the masses like quicker and faster than than a lot of, uh, a lot of other companies could have done, including High Times. It took them a lot longer to get the following you guys did. A lot of that culture had to do with, with events. 
Do you have an event that's in your mind as one of like the favorite ones that you put on? Uh, the golden ticket in in uh, in Las Vegas was a great event with the pool that jutted out of the, the building. That's one that that sticks out in my mind as well as maybe the first or second annual dope awards in Soto. That was a, a great um, event where everyone kind of got together. Uh, what's one of your favorites? Oh, uh, way too many to even talk about. But, you know, when we started Dope Magazine, I appreciate those kind words. You know, dope stood for defending our patients everywhere. And I think, you know, to your point, high times, that's where I learned about, to me, that counterculture uh, and, and understood about the plant, grew with this. So I give them a lot of credit because I was one of those, you know, young people who are definitely fascinated about the plant very early. And that really drove everything I did. But when we started Dope, we realized that the patients and that the, the med medicinal aspects of it was very important to us. So I think for us, we thought that was a more palatable conversation as we started talking about the masses. And to, to us, it was really about being really lucky in timing about where legalization was coming and the conversation started coming and more people wanted to have that conversation, but they were more willing to have that conversation. I think all of us were always in the backgrounds, always in the shadows, not talking about it, you know, I mean, in fear of persecution or, or anything or fear of, to me, ridiculation or every, all those things that we were all afraid of. If you smoke cannabis, you're one of those people. And uh, I think changing that conversation was really important. And of course, you know, uh, being in the hospitality industry for a long time, we threw so many different events. And, you know, the key for us is how can we bring things in regular industries into the cannabis industry and show the industry that we can do it right? I mean, uh, events back in the day were more private, you know, like sessions, and it was very more counterculture. But in order to kind of bring, you know, this industry more into the credible side, if we wanted to start throwing these events, which were very difficult because number one, it was about compliance. Well, number two, different to me, venues were not really open to having us uh, come in there. They were scared too. And I think the threat of them doing a cannabis event and losing their, you know, their, their, you know, whatever it is, you know, the, uh, you know, as far as regulation was, was very important. So I want to say like one of my favorite events is always our first one. I mean, you'll always remember your first one. And uh, our first one was a dope cup. And uh, that was where we wanted to give awards to, you know, different cultivators, different categories. And I remember it being a pretty small event, but as, <clears throat> excuse me, the word got out, uh, you know, we realized that we needed to make sure that we went lockstep with all of the compliance agencies to be able to pull this off. And so there was a difficult time and also explaining to the venue also that this is how we're going to consume. This is how we're going to uh, set this whole thing up. This is how we're going to work with the compliance officers. And that was already a difficult part of it. Uh, but, you know, I remember walking into there, setting it up and, you know, we were bootstrapping everything. So throwing on an event like this is you know, to me, utilizing your funds and, and, you know, there's a nervous side of you that is this going to work? And I remember walking the police department through, the fire department through, the health department through, and they came in a group of, you know, a pack. And we walked them through and there was consumption and they looked at it. And towards the end, they looked and they just said, nice work, young man. And when they left, I just remember this moment where I was like, we did it. And I remember everyone just cheering. And we're talking about, to me, some of the first adapters, some of the biggest pioneers and brands that are still around today. But being able to do that was, was a memory that I just will never forget. And I remember having, you know, Vivian help hand out the awards, you know, with Hemp Fest and all these. I could just visualize the OGs again. And I thought that was a pretty, you know, that was always, to me, that set a standard for us. 
How do we do all these things in compliance? Because we have to show the better we can go ahead and show people like there's a safe way to do it. You don't want to, you know, you want to work with them. And back in the day, there was a little bit of a, you know, disconnect, you know, of the old legacy and what was to be more of the recreational one. And I think going through that process really helped us throw all of these other incredible events. We end up doing the Dope Industry Award Show, which is our black tie event. And that's really to, you know, instead of, to me, there's brands now, there's inventors, there's all these activists, and we wanted to recognize those folks too. And it also gave us an opportunity to, to put together hardworking people who have put their heads down this whole time uh, to come out, see each other, meet each other, and kind of start more collaborating with each other. So, uh, you know, along with the Dope Cup, we did the Dope Industry Award Show, and then we also did the Bud Tender Appreciation Day, which is called the Bad Party. And uh, <clears throat> that was just a fun way to get the bud tender, you know, around more products and show an appreciation for them. So ultimately at the end, it was about always building community with dope. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting too that you mentioned the, that first party where you kind of saw consumption and it just opened up everything. Cause I have the same feeling about cannabis lounges in general, which is why I, I wrote the, uh, a bill submitted it to the Cannabis Alliance last year to try and overturn Washington's felony on maintaining and operating a marijuana lounge, which might be the country's most strict law uh, preventing cannabis lounges. Um, and I, I, I spent my own time writing that bill because I felt that it's the soul, it's the window into the soul of the community. Being able to see consumption, I think, is going to overturn a lot of people's opinions, like the fire department, health department, and all those other regulators you mentioned probably saw it and were like, man, high five, young man, way to go. I think as soon as more people can see marijuana lounges and realize that it's not, you know, the evil thing that they, they thought, that it's going to kind of propel the industry to that next level, um, but hopefully it will be fast tracked eventually. Right now it's been derailed because of the pandemic as delivery and other things kind of get fast tracked. Um, events also completely side railed uh, for, from the pandemic. Can you kind of uh, explain what 2020 was for David Tran, how it affected your business and how you pivoted to stay relevant? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to your point of consumption lounges, you know, a couple of years ago we were sitting down with Pete Holmes and, I think there's, you know, he overwhelmingly supports it. You know, here you are uh, legalizing cannabis, but you're not giving anybody a place to consume it safely. So now you're kind of contradicting what you're trying to do by, you know, allowing people to smoke. But I can't, if I'm a tourist, I can't go to my hotel to do it. In fact, I can't stand outside and do it. Uh, and uh, ultimately at the end, I just think that you're absolutely right. You know, when we get to that point, we're going to start, you know, using that, normalizing uh, the process of this and being able to go to like Las Vegas and sitting at the new cannabis lounge. You know, it's not what people think it is. It's not this big, you know, smoke filled, dangerous situation. You're really talking about this very, very peaceful, very calm a uh, place where people can, you know, again, share in this passion. And that's what's beautiful in, in doing that. So to me, events have been everything, you know, to me, my whole life. And, you know, right when COVID hit, you know, me and James Ahogny, we started a, actually a company called Fairchild. And Fairchild, what we wanted to do was provide uh, tools for event producers. And that started with being able to actually sell tickets and be able to market their events because that seems to be a real bottleneck uh, as you know companies like Eventbrite and these other companies aren't really allowing it and it, you know and it seems like we're trying to all always do a work around the cannabis industry how do we work around these laws right it's just like come towed up to the line but don't go over and that's what you know everyone in the cannabis industry has been trying to do so how do we put together a platform that allows that and then also a, you know a platform that really supports the industry because you know dope like i said has always been about connecting collaboration building this uh community so to me it's like my nature is to be in the middle of that conversation and to me events is always that conversations i i, I would say i've been to at least 200 different expos conferences 
all over the United States. And, you know, to me, that's where I'm building my relationships. That's where I'm learning every, the new, what's going on that's new in the industry. And I'm that, you know, that's my learning there. So, and I think a lot of companies too, utilize that as an opportunity to get right with their audience. So uh, we think that that was super important, but uh, right around March, and, and we were also producing events for uh, people too, because we realized how hard it is to do. And a lot of companies, honestly with you, we want them to do what they do best and then allow someone else to take care of that other part of it because throwing events can really take you off uh, focus. And, 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 and ultimately at the end, you just want to always surround yourself by professionals who both, you know, really just focus in on that. So we had right before COVID hit, we had four or five events planned, some pretty large scale ones uh, planned out in different states, one in Denver, we had a pretty big one uh, after party for Hall of Flowers and that all just disappeared. So we decided immediately and I was down in Cabo and we decided, I mean, 420 was about a month away. And, uh, you know, we immediately decided, you know, we need to continue to, 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 to help the industry right now who's being pretty much just sideswiped from the uh, uh, event. So we did a virtual uh, event called Chronic Relief. Uh, we did that in 30 days. And, you know, I'm going to tell you how lucky we are to know incredible people because we were able to get a hundred and something companies to commit to, you know, uh, sending a message out to the industry. We had Whoopi on there. We had Montel. We had so many different, uh, you know, Tommy Chong. They all came out and you know, wanted to show their support, you know, for the industry. And uh, we were able to put that virtual event together. And we also then realized that, you know, the events weren't coming back. So virtual events, how do we go ahead and continue to support those uh, events? You know, uh, Charles at uh, Emerge Conference, we helped them, uh, you know, put that uh, together. Uh, they did an incredible job of curating the speakers and uh, Charles and their team, kudos to, to those guys working again, you know, having to pivot from, uh, you know, physical events into digital is not, you know, easy. So uh, to us now that we're here now, uh, it actually gave us an opportunity to build uh, our platform and now cater it towards where we think the industry is going to go. And so now in 2020, we're pretty bullish about where, where we have our ears to the ground. We're going to launch the event, but we're also hearing that a lot of event producers are looking at quarter three, quarter four to start building their events. And this is a perfect time to uh, continue to start planning for that. What happens if, you know, immune compromised individuals don't go or people don't <laughs> want to fly this year? Um, how are you going to bring it back and, and I guess I'm asking how the how is the industry going to bring it back how are we going to get back to 30,000 people at MJ BizCon is it going to be virtual reality is it going to be the the oculus headset I'm asking all of these these uh, industry folks if virtual reality hardware software is the bridge between being there in person and not like how do you how do you really make it so that you're there because these virtual events just aren't doing it yeah it's very difficult <clears throat> excuse me, I don't think you can ever replace human connection and human uh, transactions at, at all. So I think that there's going to be a, a little bit of both, right? I, I also know that going to events and setting up events could be very expensive too, to, to, to a company and a, a serious commitment. So um, I think there's going to be a balance. And I think, you know, also that it's going to change the way we set up the way we do events, uh, different protocols that we're all going to take in order to maintain the safety of it. You know, are we all going to continue to share joints like we did, you know, uh, in between? Those are real, real questions that we have to, you know, really ask ourselves. So I think, you know, I think we're cautiously optimistic about uh, getting back there, but I know now that there's going to have to be a little bit of a um, depending on what you're trying to do, there's going to be a, you know, mix of it. I, I, I see virtual events happening and I see in some instances, it works out for certain sectors of our industry. And, you know, some people just want to get out, get out. I just want to specifically target, 
you know, an accomplished A, B, and C. And a lot of times, like, let's just say these events, like B2B events where you're connecting the retailer to like, let's say brands, there's easier to be able to set up those phone calls virtually gives both of them like to me time efficiencies, but they get to accomplish what they accomplish. But there's so many businesses that, that, that need the visual, that need the human touch. And I believe that, you know, that's still going to be very needed. But I think now you're going to have to ask yourself, you know, we'll look at each company and go, what's my strategy? What is my, you know, ultimate goal there? Is it brand awareness? Is it straight, you know, being able to connect to, you know, a certain demographics? And so I think that that's going to continue to change. And I mean, um, you know, I'm 45 and the technology is like seriously coming so fast that uh, it's hard to keep up. You know, one day it's Instagram, the next day is TikTok. The next day it's Clubhouse. And it's hard to keep up with these things, but I think as long as you look at those platforms and understand what you're trying to do, you'll be able to focus in on what you feel is going to be uh, the best route for you. Yeah, it's it's been a hard year and there's been a lot of people that have had to kind of be creative, myself included. So my consulting business relied on these events to meet new people and drum up new business. And so as that's kind of, uh, weaned off a little bit, I've had to pivot myself. So taking on maybe new clients that I wouldn't otherwise think about, uh, like the C3, an innovative tech company that we're, we're licensing uh, a trading algorithm to investors to, to take advantage of the market. So yes. uh, there are opportunities that I wouldn't have been able to take on had there not been a, a pandemic, mm -hmm. right? So I think if you're able to take advantage of those opportunities when they come, uh, you're going to be in a much better spot. I know I feel like it was uh, a nightmare for me, but now it's a blessing. Yes. So I'm wondering with yourself, um, events specifically, what are some of the events that you're hoping to put on this year? And how are you going to kind of hedge that bet if things don't go third quarter, fourth quarter as anticipated? Yeah, no, you hit the point right away. You know, I mean, I've been to at least 200 shows in the last you know, seven years. And what you realize is that as you go out there, you've never really stopped to look at what you were building, the relationships you were building. And it's just one of those things, it's ongoing. And if it works, then you're, you're connected. But you know, that, you know, taking this year, going back to kind of connecting with people and having the time to do that has been everything right and everyone like to your point is just like is changing their business strategies and building those different strategies so you know you know the other company that I built was goldfinger's uh group which is our consulting group and uh you know kind of going back to a lot of the companies and having the time now to say you know what we can actually help you you know before it's just like how can i connect you and now the consulting company arm is just like, how can I actually help you accomplish your goals? And so now we've built different projects. We have a project in Colorado that we took from, you know, pretty much zero to, you know, growing. And that's why I have my Agrify shirt on right now. They just went public uh, a few days ago, raised $54 million. But, you know, we're utilizing their technology down in Colorado uh, so that we can, you know, kind of answer that, you know, really that, that question, how can we build consistency? How can multi-state operators do the same thing over and over consistently? And I think that is one of the keys to, you know, answering, you know, our question and how we're going to approach this global cannabis market. And of course, Washington, we have our assets here working with Freddy's Fuego, a wonderful company with a wonderful team. And it's just been so fun to be able to come in share our experience and really get down and execute and show these um to me these operators that let's let's maximize your potential let's fulfill you know let's build the efficiencies in there and going to teach you how to, uh, to 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 do that and put you in a better position and we're also doing that in massachusetts and again these these deals are because i went to the ncia uh conference shook hands with someone and now you know you know, during the pandemic, gave them a call and they're just like, whoa, let's talk. Let's go ahead and build that. And then next thing you know, now you're consulting with them and, you know, talking about building this vertical out. So, you know, to us, that becomes, you know, uh, everything. That's what the pandemic does. I mean, of course, I could have probably met more people, but as I stopped, 
there's plenty if you really look within your network. And I think that's what we did. And to me in 2020, what does do events look like? I think events still like to me and all of our companies is going to be a component of our marketing. It will always be a component of how we get the message out. But, you know, being an event company, uh, we still are bullish about what what is happening in it. And, you know, for 420, we're like, you know what? Are we going to build up? We did a virtual event last year. Uh, it, it's a different year now. It's just like people were, you know, went through that for a year. Are people going to pay attention to that uh, this year? And so we decided, you know what? We're going to go ahead and roll the dice. This is kind of uh, breaking news right now, I suppose, but we're going to uh, probably build a golf tournament here in Washington. Uh, we feel like golf is, uh, you know, uh, an activity that I think right now is, you know, already, you know, allowed in, in a limited capacity. And, you know, I know you're a golfer. I'm a, I'm a golfer. And, you know, part of this is a selfish reason, uh, you know, because I'd love to do that. But uh, at the same time, too, we don't want to miss out on the opportunity to bring everybody together. We've been doing that for the last 10 years, uh, you know, on 420. And I think the cool part to your point is that now we could bring in those to me, digital components of that, you know, how can we interview people, you know, utilize digital assets to go ahead and take a tournament. That's a physical event, but also making it a little more national by virtue of, you know, technology also. And I think that's important. We want to also show, you know, the sponsors and all those good value also, you know, not only are they going to be around some of the most, you know, influential people in Washington, we're also going to send their message out into a larger audience. And I think, you know, to your point, what's that combination of that? And, uh, you know, we're going to have to see how that goes. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we, we hedge the bet by, you know, making sure that it's an outdoor event. We know that's, you know, pretty much in Washington, at least allowed. And, uh, you know, we're going to be working with a lot of event producers, you know, with our platform Fairchild, uh, as they become, you know, integrated more into our program. And, you know, whether you're a free event or whether you're an event that's selling tickets, we want to invite all of those event producers in. And hopefully we're doing the right job by giving them the tools, you know, whether you're looking for, uh, sponsorship, whether you're looking for venues, whether you're looking for uh, marketing, those are type of things that we want to build on a turnkey uh, turnkey way. What does your crystal ball say about future states? Because I know that there's a, some golf tournaments that are going to be popping up in Colorado and Arizona for the same reason, because it's cannabis and events. It's kind of the only way you can do it is, is to have these, these golfing events. And so that kind of reminded me um, of that, but I'm curious about what states you think might come on board after um, in November, we had like South Dakota and Arizona, New Jersey. Um, I think uh, Missouri went medical. There was another state I'm missing. I think Kentucky is going to go legal soon because they have the most underfunded pension plan. I know mm -hmm. Vermont said that they're broke and they weren't even talking about kids with epilepsy. They're just saying mm -hmm. we need money. And then New York's got FOMO from New Jersey. So yeah. a lot of things have been happening with the House and the Senate and the presidency going Democratic, which is in favor of, of cannabis. And I'm just curious about where you think the industry is going, any uh, future events or consulting uh, in any new states? Yeah, um, I mean, I think this year shows, and I think as more uh, states start to realize, you use the word FOMO, I think it's not only building out a proof of concept that, you know, legalization helps your state and, and, and builds revenue and, uh, you know, con, you know uh, youth consumption goes down. And as we get all of these statistics back and this data back, it allows different states to do it. So I see it really happening fast. And I mean, if you've been around, it was Washington, Colorado, and then next year, it was a really started building momentum. And right now at this point, I see states like Idaho and all of these other places starting to have the West Virginia. These are all conversations that are happening right now. Um, we look at this as a global opportunity right now. And, you know, right now we're building in three different states right now, but we realize that where the puck is going is that these multi-state operational are starting to get funding simply because 
people are setting themselves up uh, for the idea that these larger companies are going to go ahead and start getting into the industry. And I think, you know, I've, I get emails every day. I make it my point to jump on all these new letter, newsletters, Cannabis Venture, all these other ones. And all you see all, all day right now is a lot of MSOs are raising money. But also, I think standalone businesses are looking to start building a more global plan, whether it's themselves or whether it's kind of now consolidating with other folks. So, you know, for us, we're seeing that trend. So, you know, we're building a multi-state operational plan right now to build in the current assets we have, but then building those efficiencies and economies of scale the same way we built it in these individual ones. Uh, that's really where, uh, you know, we find uh, the future right now. And that's, that's where we're, where we're going. And, you know, as we're talking to different standalone businesses, I think when we tell them the story about where we think it's going, they see it the same way also. And we'd like to always work with those type of companies to, again, um, you know, either bring them into the mix or at least advise them to set themselves up, get their house clean to take it to the next uh, level because I think those you know to me that opportunity comes when you're ready uh, and a lot of companies right now are are built for short-term you know year-to-year -year growth not future growth so um, you know it's inevitable I mean I think you know the uh, decriminalization or legalization is is inevitable when it's going to happen is up to you know is, is is up in the air but I would build it like it was happening soon and that's what i urge uh you know the people that i know around me yeah with mexico taking a look at legalization in canada already there this fomo sandwich that we have is really about the money right so the federal government's going to be taking a look at that i would be um planning on that sooner rather than later <laughs> yeah, uh, agreed with you yeah um good stuff um for anybody that is interested in either, you know, Goldfinger Consulting or Fairchild events, um, is there any events that coming up that you want to plug, uh, websites, information, anything that we didn't talk about that you'd like to uh, discuss? No, well, if you're in Washington or if you're a national brand looking at Washington, we're going to uh, be announcing our golf tournament, uh, Chronic Relief Golf Tournament. Of course, the most important part of that is bringing people together, but also giving back. Uh, it's always a, you know, a, a charity event for us uh, and giving back to a couple of charities. So if you're interested in that, just, you know, hit me up, you know, at the Fairchild, F-A-R-E-C-H-I-L-D or Dave at Fairchild. And of course, for Goldfingers, you know, if you're, you know, out there and you've been building your business a long time and, and, and you find yourself in a position that you want to, you know, either grow or solidify a foundation where you're at, then, you know, Goldfingers, you know, me and my partner have been doing this for a long time. Me on the on the dope side, and uh, and my partner too. You know, uh, built a vertical down in California that was doing about a hundred million dollars in revenue. So he understands to me the complete vertical chain, uh, and also the game plan for you know uh, a multi-state strategy. Also, so I think you know for us, we're always open to talking to any of those uh, businesses and uh, and. You know, that's that's where you'll find me. And of course, on the uh, Instagram, it's the Tranimal, uh, no, it's Tranimal Chronicles. Uh, you can uh, say hi to me there. And to me, it's about being available uh, and being, uh, you know, open to, you know, talking to anyone. So uh, uh, we appreciate it. Yeah, and we'll have some of those links, uh, social media links, as well as links to uh, Fairchild and Goldfinger in the show notes uh, in the description. So... With that, I think we're going to roll this one up. I want to thank my guest, Dave Tran. He is the uh, co-founder, I guess, of uh, Goldfinger Consulting and Fairchild Events. Dave, thanks for being on the Talking Hedge. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, appreciate you. I am Josh Kincaid. This is the Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't, and I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got. <laughs>